Good morning, everybody. Morning. Scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. As we sung it, it speaks to us. It does have treasures in its store. And I pray that you'd help us to see them, to hear them. Jesus, you would say, let him who has ears to hear, let them hear. Lord, help us to truly hear the good news of Jesus and receive and believe you this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Mike, if you don't know, and I'm one of the pastors here at New City, and it's my privilege and responsibility to try to help you understand and explain what we just read. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 6. Romans is a letter, kind of the foundational stone of the New Testament, teaching people uh, of all the different ethnicities and nations uh, about what it means to be human, what it means to be fallen, what it means to be redeemed now in Christ, and, and what kind of new communities Jesus is developing all over the world. Romans is foundational to all that stuff. And we find ourselves in chapter 6. In chapter 6, two big questions are asked. Okay, And so just by way of introduction, I kind of want to set the table here with these two questions. One is a review from the last couple of weeks where Paul says, what shall we say? This is chapter 6 and verse 1. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he goes, by no means. No way. Don't do that. What we read this morning, very similar. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? And then again, by no means. No way. We shouldn't do that. And so there's going to be certainly some overlap. That those questions are too similar for there not to be overlap. But we need to just remind ourselves, refresh or maybe learn for the first time, depending on where you're at in your journey, but what is driving those questions? Why is he even asking that at this point in the letter? And what's driving that is the reality that as human beings, you can be forgiven and restored and transferred from a position of being condemned before God to a position of being justified before God freely as a gift. That's what's driving that question. In fact, you haven't quite understood how free and amazing, as the song goes, God's grace is if you're not asking that question. It's like, you're telling me, that, and especially if you, you know, we spent a number of weeks in chapters 1 through 3 that talk about kind of the depth and pervasive nature of human rebellion before God. You're saying that all of that sin can be forgiven and I can exchange from a status of condemnation that leads to death into a status of justification that leads to life. And all of that is a gift through the death and resurrection of Jesus. I receive that freely. Like, so don't get it twisted. Many of you I know in this room have heard that message many times. 
Don't get it twisted, though. Like, if that starts to lose its luster and its shine on you, that's a danger. You shouldn't be like, oh, well, yeah, I've heard about that grace before, whatever. Like, <laughs> you're in a danger zone if that's how you're responding to that. Okay? This grace is so deep, so pervasive. And I've got to say this word carefully. This isn't preacher speak. It's, it's radical and fundamental in its nature. Actually, grace can be disorienting. It's like you can think there's such a good person over here, and yet they're separated from God, and there's this person who's been declared righteous, and they seem like their life is a struggle bus. That's grace, and that's disorienting. It's radical, it's profound, it's deep, and it's so free that one of the natural questions that come to you, it's like, where where my sin abounded, grace abounds all the more, well then can I just like say I want this grace, and then just live how I was living before, I can keep all of my pet sins that I know Jesus doesn't like and I can still do them anyway? That's the question. And he goes, no way! (laughs) Can't do that! And last week we found out one of the reasons why. We found out that alongside of this new status that we have in Christ of being justified, we found out that we were, you know, I love this imagery, we were immersed into him. We were incorporated into Him. We died with Him, and now we are risen with Him. And because we've been united with Jesus Christ, you can't continue living the way you did before. You're in Christ. And so last week, we kind of looked at verses 1 through 14. It kind of focuses on the past work of Christ and what's happened to them in the past and how it affects their present. Today, he asks a similar question, but there's a different answer. It's a layered answer. It's certainly not antithetical to the former answer, but it's another layer to consider, and it moves us from the present, looks forward to the future. And the answer this week is, should I keep sinning even though I'm under grace? Which, oh, by the way, isn't that great? (laughs) When you're under the rule of King Jesus, what's it like to be in his kingdom? It's grace everywhere. Well, if it's grace everywhere, should I just keep all my sinning? No way! Why? Here's why. Because if you do that, if you present yourself to sin as your master, it will lead to death and judgment. In a sense, you'll be right back to where you were in Adam. Contrary, because of this new nature that you have and this new status that you have, on the foundation of that new nature and that new status, because you died with Christ and because you're resurrected with Him, now you should present yourself to Him consistently and daily as your new king and master and that presentation won't lead to death but it will lead to life it won't lead to unrighteousness but to righteousness that's what paul is arguing so it's like this is who you are now and this is going to set the trajectory of your future who you present yourself to sets the trajectory so here's the big idea from this morning well before i give you the big idea (laughs) A quick analogy of this, if you're familiar with Scripture, this is very much akin to the nation of Israel being set free from Egypt. Maybe if you're not even that familiar with the Bible, you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments. I think you're probably at this point in life maybe more familiar with the Bible than that movie. (laughs) But anyway, the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and God came in faithfulness to His promise and dramatically rescued them by the blood of the Lamb over the doorpost, and they were set free, and they were on their way to the promised land, right? Right? And they got out into the middle, you know, they started that journey, they were scared, and it was hard and difficult, and what did they want to do? They wanted to go back to where? Egypt. And they're like, oh, it was so much better back then. It's like, no, you guys have amnesia. Paul is saying a similar type thing here. In Christ, he's the ultimate liberator. He's the new Moses who has set us free, and now we're on a journey to the promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. But he's saying, don't look back. Don't be like the Israelites and want to go back to the old taskmaster. So that's the big idea this morning. Here's the big idea. Because of our new life in Christ Jesus, because of that, we must no longer present ourselves to sin. But we present ourselves to Him daily. That's the big idea. So this morning, the way our roadmaps can be a little bit different. If you've been here for a little while, I usually have three points. Usually my first one's the longest, my third one's the shortest. I think I had a 12-year-old come tell me that one time. It was great. <laughs> okay. But here's, here's what we're going to do today. I'm giving this big idea, I'll repeat it a couple of times just so you're clear on it. And then I'm going to give you, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to look at five observations from this big idea. They'll be brief, I promise you. Each service has been fine. Five observations from this 
that are really kind of just summarizing and clarifying what we read. So five observations from there. Then I'm going to give you one really important implication from that. And then one application, and that's it. So that's where we're going. Let's look at some of these observations then. First one is this. There are only two options. Okay? This is where, you know, may, maybe depending on your personality type, you know, depends on what you like. I didn't mean to do this, but I'm, I'm a guy who uh, doesn't like when there's just two options. I want nuance. I want, you know, I prefer that. I'm the kind of dad who says things like this to my kids. It's always more complicated than you think. My kids know that sentence over and over and over again. So I, I don't like it when it's just, it's so kind of cut and dry all the time. My wife does. She's a more categorical thinker. She's right on this one, okay? In this particular instance, when we're thinking about our lives before God, it's, it's either you are presenting yourself to sin or you're presenting yourself to God in Christ Jesus. Those are the only two options. And this actually goes back to chapter 5 because really there's only two ways to be human. You are either in Adam, this is chapter 5, and that's the way of being human that you know and that you're used to and that you carry out. In Adam, we saw that we are fallen. We have sinful desires that lead us away from God. And those desires are like capital S sin, a, a taskmaster who leads us away from God. And the result of that is death. That's, that's how everybody is human. Everybody sins, everybody dies. That's the only option. You're either in Adam, meaning you're in sin, or you are in Christ and therefore in his righteousness leading to life. Those are the only two options. So part of that's nice. You avoid analysis paralysis. Paralysis analysis. I'm actually getting stuck in paralysis analysis as I say it. It's not like thousands of options out there for you. You can either be human on your own terms, which is governed by sin and death, or you can seek to be human on God's terms in Christ Jesus. Those are your options. Now, that's a big decision, obviously, but it's clear and it's simple. And it's what's in front of you here today. It's actually what's throughout the Bible. God presented that to Adam and Eve in the garden. You can obey, leading to life, or you can disobey, leading to death. The second generation, when they were, the Israelites, when they were going to enter into the promised land, finally after 40 years, Moses says to that second generation, I lay before you two options here today. Choose to serve and obey the Lord, leading to life. Choose to disobey and forget the Lord, leading to death. It's been the consistent option. Joshua said even after Moses, he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then even Jesus himself clarifies this, and he, he makes statements along these lines. It's like, it's this or it's that. Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. He's not giving a multiplicity of other options. It's either like you're serving the God of this world represented by money and mammon, or you're serving me. Or he'll say things in John 8, whoever sins is a servant of, capital S, sin. Paul's getting these things from the scripture, from the storyline of the Bible, and even from Jesus himself. So there's only two options. You're either going to be human in Adam, governed by sin and death, and present yourself to that reality, or you're going to be human in Christ Jesus and present yourself to that reality. Which makes sense, by the way, logically and philosophically. There is only one true and living God who is different and distinct from everyone and everything else. And so you either present yourself to him, or it's just literally everything else, categorized by sin and Adam. And even the uniqueness of Jesus calls for this. Jesus is not just one of many other gods. He is the living God in human form. He's the revelation of the one true and living God. And so it's either Jesus or anything and everything else. That's the decision you're making. Two, not only is there two options, but the two options and this will be very brief, have very clear trajectories and pathways that spin out from them. If you present yourself, because you are in Adam, the old way of being human, and the sinful desires that are enslaving you, and the condemnation that comes with that, that leads from sin to more sin, to more, he, he talked about it in there, from impurity to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, which ultimately leads to death which death is the final judgment concept and idea in the Bible. Again, from Genesis you know, 2 and 3, where you know, if 
you eat of this, you're surely going to die, all the way to Revelation 21, 22, or actually it's Revelation 20, where he talks about the second death. Death is the final judgment. So if you present yourself to sin in Adam, it leads to death, more and more sin, ultimately to death. Very clear. And here, on the other side, you present yourself to God in Christ Jesus. It actually leads, he says, to the word sanctification, which is a churchy word for, in Paul's theology, becoming more and more like Jesus. So when you present yourself to Jesus, you become more like Jesus, and that type of life and that trajectory leads to eternal life. So there's two options before you. One is leading to sin and more sin and death. One is leading to Jesus Christ and righteousness and more righteousness and eternal life. Third, observation. Our ongoing presentation of ourselves to Jesus is the idea, is based on initial conversion. So stay with me here. The reality that you have been in, you were in Adam and now you're in Christ. We looked at that in chapter 5 and last week in chapter 6. Now that you are in Christ Jesus, that becomes the foundation upon which you present yourself in an ongoing way to Jesus. You need that. I actually love that he references this to them. He's not just saying, hey, present yourself kind of in a, a random or uh, a nebulous kind of a way. It's like specifically because you have been placed into Christ, now on the basis of that, because you are in Him, now present yourself. To use an, an illustration from family, you know, in situations where adoption is um, called for in our culture, it's, you, you can't expect the, the child who's being adopted to act like a son or a daughter if they're not actually the son or the daughter first. The transfer has to happen. Once that legal, official transfer has happened, and those, I've been in those courtrooms, those moments are pretty powerful where the judge now declares this person to be a member of that family. It's pretty moving. Now, based on that, act accordingly. That's what's happening here. And he, he references this kind of pastorally for them. He's not just saying, hey, act like you're in Christ as if you aren't. No, you are, so therefore act like it. If you look at verse 17, he's got this gratitude kind of expression. But thanks be to God that you once were slaves, you who once were slaves to sin, you've now become obedient from the heart. I love that expression. He's, he's looking at these, these Roman Christians and he's saying, hey, remember there was a time when you were in Adam, but now you're in Christ. If you grew up in the church, by the way, this can be a little bit trickier because maybe there's not this one big converting moment, but over the course of time, it will become clear to you, if you've grown up in the church, if you give your faith to Jesus, that, oh yes, I've given my heart to Jesus, I've surrendered to him from my heart, I want Jesus as my king. Or, if you didn't grow up in the church, you might have a clear idea of like, well, yeah, man, I was living like the devil before. I heard Jesus, I met Jesus, and now my life is different. Either way, that foundational conversion idea is, is the foundation upon which you present yourself in an ongoing way. So we'll talk about that. So these two things work together. The status and the ongoing presentation are both essential. It's an important observation. Fourth. <laughs> I just said fourth. Fourth, our presentation to God is not perfection, but progress. Everyone say progress. It's really important. It's not that you were transferred from being in Adam, the old way of being human, to now you're the new way of being human in Christ, and it's like, zapow! Everything just about you changed. It's a progressive kind of change. And so he highlights this in verse number 19. He says, I'm, he says, I'm speaking to you in human terms. He says, I'm, I'm trying to grapple, which I feel his tension here, like I'm trying to grapple with how I can express this to you. You were slaves to sin, but now you're slaves to God. I'm speaking in human terms. And then he says, because of your natural limitations. It's a good translation for sure. Obviously, the ESV folks, good scholars there. Other scholars have translated that as weakness of your flesh. Paul kind of recognizes that, yes, you've been transferred, but those, the, the reality of being in Adam, I love how Pastor Dave says this, is still kind of lurking in and around the shadows of your life, trying to wreak havoc in your life and tempt you and pull you away. 
And so he recognizes that, that reality is still part of our world and part of our lives. And he recognizes that there's a human limitations to us. We can't just force ourselves through this process. So it's not perfection, but it is progression. So, but again, this goes back to the original question. Well, Pastor Mike said it wasn't perfection, so I guess I can just take it easy on this over here. <laughs> no! That's the whole point of the passage is don't act that way. Don't think that way. It's a concession because we're not perfected yet, but it's not an excuse. Because then he goes on to say there is inevitable progress. And this is what he says in verse 20. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time through those things that you're now ashamed of? <laughs> I mean, this is a little bit confrontational from Paul. He's basically saying the old way to live in Adam is deficient to the new way of being human in Christ. You know, we need to rid ourselves of this idea that being a Christian is believing a certain set of things essential to being a Christian. But really being a Christian is a life that's being transformed into love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. That's what it means to be a Christian in Christ Jesus. You're actually different than you were before. And that's what he says. Don't you remember how your life used to be and how you know, it was unrighteous and it was, it was, it was not noble? And some of the things that you used to do, now you're ashamed of those things? So he's saying there was progress. I'm not everything I was. I'm not everything I'm going to be. But I'm in progress. I'm moving forward. And so we recognize that this reality that we're in of being in Christ is progressive. And because it's progressive, as we'll see, it requires presentation. Now, he kind of sums up these observations in a very famous verse, chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just by a quick show of hands, how many people have heard that verse before? Raise your hand. Wow. How many people have memorized it? A lot of you. So, tons of people familiar with that verse. <laughs> I'm about to alter your understanding of it in two significant ways. And not to be clever, but to really help you understand contextually what's being said. First, most people who have heard that verse think that it predominantly applies to non-Christians. People who haven't given themselves to Jesus yet. And we say to them, hey, because you're a sinner, the payment for that sin is death. But you can avoid that death if you believe in God. He'll give you a free gift of eternal life. Right? That's how we use that verse. In this context, is he talking to non-Christians or Christians? Christians. Uh oh, hello. He's talking to Christians. This verse is actually a warning. This verse is saying to you, if you're somebody who says, I name the name of Christ, I believe in Christ, but I offer myself, I present myself to the old master. I want to go back to Egypt, as it were, and that becomes the categorical characteristic uh, lifestyle that I'm living, then the wages that you're going to get from that master is death. That's different. <laughs> now, you can still use it with non-Christians, too. It's still an invitation that way. But primarily in context, that's what's happening. But, if you offer yourself to God, He gives you the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first one is, contextually, it's a, it's a kind of warning slash promise to Christians. And the second thing that we need to, to clarify our understanding about with this verse is what the gift actually is. We tend to think that the gift is eternal life, which is what it says. But we normally equate, I'm gonna, I don't want to accuse all of you, but we normally equate eternal life with going to does he, talk about, does he talk about heaven here at all? No. He's not, not talking about heaven, but he's not primarily talking about heaven. Let's just slow down and read what the gift actually is. Okay? Let's just read what it says. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is. Is that past, present, or future tense? Present. The free gift is eternal life, 
great, but that seems to be a present reality. Is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord? So it's life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gift. The gift isn't going to heaven as if that's separate from Jesus somehow. The gift is life in Jesus. The gift is union with Christ. That's the free gift. John Barclay, is a, uh, I believe he's a British scholar, really has a great uh, perspective on this. He says, the gift in this case is the grace of Christ and the believer's new identity is formed in the tightest possible connection to Christ, the risen Lord. What grace conveys is not a thing, but a person. It establishes a relationship. The grace establishes a relationship where the gift cannot be separated from the person who gave it. Grace is not an object or even simply a status, the gift of justification or forgiveness. Grace is not an object past from Christ to the believers or a quality that's infused into them. It is, first and foremost, a transformative relationship with the giver. And all God's people said, Amen. That means when you gave your life to Jesus, He joined Himself to you, and you're stuck with Him. And He won't allow sin to be there. He's on a hunt to get rid of it in your life. That's the gift. The gift is Jesus. You know, sometimes I've jokingly said to my kids, they're like, well, did you get me something on the trip? And I'm like, no, I'm back. I am the gift. <laughs> I'm the gift that keeps on giving, baby. As silly as that is in that situation, that's actually what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm the gift. A relationship, a union with me that lasts forever is the gift. And whatever status I have and whatever gifts I give and however long I'm going to live, that's what's going to happen to you. Whoa. So think about this. You never had one, when you became a Christian, you never had one gift from Jesus that was not accompanied by his presence, not e presence, not even for a second. Jesus, the, the, the eternal life is not forgiveness of sins and justification and going to heaven when I die type stuff. It's union with Jesus Christ, which that makes a ton of sense in chapter 6 when he's been encouraging these people to present themselves to Jesus because they died with him and now they're alive with him. He's not randomly going to bring up heaven. He's going to talk about their present union. This is the gift. So here's the big implication. Ready? Here's the big implication. To be a Christian means to be in Christ. I've said that from this stage many times. If I was ever tempted to get a tattoo, that sentence might be the one, as clumsy as it may be. <laughs> to be a Christian means to be in Christ. And being in Christ, so to speak, opens up all of those other things. Forgiveness, justification, eternal life, all that. To be a Christian means to be in Christ, and to be in Christ means to continually present oneself to Him as Savior and King. How do you become a Christian? How do you get in Christ? You come to Him at the foot of the cross, so to speak, and you say, Jesus, because of your suffering, please forgive me all my sins. And you go to the empty tomb, and you recognize that he's the risen Lord, and you say, I present myself, I surrender myself to you as my king, Savior and King. That's how you become a Christian. That's how you get in Christ. And then how do you grow in that relationship in Christ? You continue to present yourself to him in the same type of way. Colossians 2, 5 says, As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The way you came in is the way you grow. So that's the massive implication of this. This is so important for the Christian church because we have this idea that we can believe in Jesus and say like, oh yeah, I, I believed on that when I was a kid or something like that, and then live very nominal Christian lives not seeking first the kingdom of God, not surrendering areas and issues of our life to Him, and then just be so confident that we're like walking with Jesus. And Paul's saying, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, again, this is Romans 6. This is the beginning of Paul's most important letter here, Romans. His fundamental teaching on what it means to be in Christ. I just showed you the status you get. Now, how do you move forward? You move forward by an ongoing surrendering and presentation of yourself to Jesus as your Savior and your King. And that is grace. 
He's not just saying, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to change you so that you don't have sin in your life at all. So it removes this kind of thinking in our minds that, oh, well, I'll take care of that later. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, Jesus, will be gracious. It's like a half-truth. It's believing the first part of Romans and not Romans 6 through 8. It's dangerous. So what should we do then? The implication leads very naturally and obviously into the application. The one application for today is that, again, go back to the big idea. Because you've been united with Christ as a free gift of grace. Because of that, here's what you should do. Present all of yourself as one who was dead and now alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, we've said this for a couple of weeks, and I've been in and around this concept of presenting yourself to Jesus and renewing your mind in Christ for a long time. And I found something new this week that just was like, oh man, really helpful. And it's this. When you present yourself to Jesus, think about that. Think about it, I mean, just in a very kind of practical day-to-day thing, where you've got an appointment with Jesus, like you're actually going to see him like in the flesh, how would you come and present yourself? Like what would you wear? I mean, that'd be crazy. Like are you going to put on your nice stuff? And then he'd be like, well, are you trying to impress me? Or would you just put on your worst clothes and be like, Jesus, I identify with the poor. Trust me. (laughs) I don't even know. Like how would you present yourself to Jesus? The Bible actually tells you how to do it. I love this. Look at chapter 6 and verse 13, the second part. But present yourselves, first of all, to God, the Father, as those who have been brought from death to life. Here's the beauty of that. So now when I present myself to Jesus, it's not the old Mike Osborne that I'm presenting. I'm not dragging the you know, proud, ego, angry, lustful Mike Osborne into the presence of God. I'm bringing the dead, now risen Mike Osborne to him. I'm now alive. The living new one is there. And I'm saying, okay, Jesus, I died with you. I've risen with you. And now we're going to work this thing out, right? Because I'm alive and you're alive. Yes. That's who you present. And so to me, that's, you know, obviously, as you can tell, more exciting. It's not guilt and shame that I'm dragging into Jesus. I'm just, my old life is gone. My new life is here. And now, Jesus, I'm just yours. I'm ready. What are you saying? You present yourself as one who is dead and now alive unto God in Christ Jesus. So where do you start? Let me just give you a couple pastoral exhortations and we'll be done. I would just say, well, first of all, I've already explained, if you're not a Christian, you're not in Christ, the invitation is open to become in Christ. Just do that first one. Jesus, I confess my sins. I recognize that I'm an Adam. The old way of being human is going to lead to death. I want to avoid that. I want you. I want to be united to you. Please take me, and he will. If you're a Christian, then what you need to do is you need to continue to develop this habit, this mindset, this practice of offering yourself to Jesus in all the ways and all the times. Now, that's a little bit overwhelming, so I would, I would boil that down to say, what are one or, one or two things that you're thinking of in your life? What's the really hard thing that you're facing right now? It's not even necessarily a sin. It might just be a big trial. You present yourself and that thing to God in Christ Jesus. I'm dead and now I'm alive. Jesus, this thing is really, really bothering me. I present it to you. Or maybe it is a sin. Jesus, I was dead to sin. Now I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know I'm still struggling with this. I present this to you. Start presenting all your stuff to Jesus. Lord, this this marriage thing has been pretty hard recently. You see, you know. That's one of my favorite prayers. I say, Lord, you know. Lord, you know. I'm presenting. I'm giving it to you. I surrender. I was dead. Now I'm alive. I surrender. And this is, we think, and even when you hear the sermon, you're going to think that that's going to be more punctual than it is progressive. It's progressive. (laughs) I thought it was more punctual than progressive early on. 20 years ago, probably, it was. I was probably around 25 years old, and I was struggling with certain sins. And I knew the key to struggling and getting over those sins was Romans 6, 7, and 8. 
So again, I've been in and around this for a couple decades. And that is the right thinking, by the way. This, it was the right place to go. And so I was like, man, I'm going to memorize Romans 6 through 8, and I'm going to meditate on it, and that's going to change me. I'm going to overcome these sins. Needless to say, none of that even remotely happened. I didn't memorize, I don't even remember memorizing any of Romans 6. I just immediately fell back into patterns of sin. And then in a tremendous display of spiritual immaturity, I threw a spiritual temper tantrum. I literally took my Bible upstairs in our townhouse at that time. I was in seminary, by the way. I took my Bible and I whipped it against the wall. A big black leather bound King James Bible. Julie was downstairs and she goes, what was that? How do you tell your wife that you just whipped God's word <laughs> against the wall? What I didn't what I wasn't processing was I was presenting myself to Jesus and then setting the pace. You don't, you don't go to King Jesus, say, I'm dead and now I'm alive. Let me give you a couple of suggestions. <laughs> you know, it's like when my players used to come to me and they would say things like, oh, coach, I think we should do this. And I'm like, well, that just shows how very little you know. your whole life long. Renew my life, that song. Lord, teach me how to live my whole life long. Which ties into another pastoral application. What about the idea of addiction? What if I'm just like so, I mean, all sin's addictive, by the way. But sometimes, you know, we label certain things as like very kind of destructive addictions and maybe rightfully so. It's like, well, don't give up. The fundamental nature of your status doesn't change and all I can say to you is once again, present it to the Lord. Present it to the Lord. Present it to the Lord. You keep presenting it to the Lord, and it will not outlast him. I don't know when and where and how it will change, but it will change. Yeah. Again, in my immaturity, I thought it was supposed to happen in a month. You might have to labor with addiction for 20 years. I've seen that in the church. I've seen other people quote-unquote, rescued or breakthrough in a month. And you're like, well, why that? You are just presenting yourself to the Lord. I, remember, I love the story of Peter and John after Jesus has risen from the dead, and they're both eating fish with Jesus there on the seaside. And uh, Jesus tells John, or no, Jesus tells Peter what's going to happen to him. Basically that Peter's going to suffer and, and be crucified. <laughs> and then Peter goes, well, what's going to happen to him? And Jesus goes, mind your own business, in so many words. He doesn't say. We are all in this together as brothers and sisters, but we also have individual journeys. Yeah. What you can do today, just like the first day, is present yourself to the Lord as yeah. one who is dead and now alive. Yeah. Yeah. And start small. Start with something small. Grow into it. I love this quote from Micah, which is, you know, Maybe a little bit random for you this morning, but not Romans. Micah chapter 7 and verse 8 says, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. Listen to this actually as the voice of Jesus first. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Now, this is not the voice of Jesus. Because I have sinned. He wasn't bearing the indignation because of his sin, but because of ours. Until he pleads my cause and execute judgment, he will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon his vindication. That's Jesus. He went through the darkness, the difficulty, the pain, the suffering, and even the death. But he said to his enemy before that happened, don't rejoice over me. It looks like I'm down now, but I'm going to rise. Now, if you are in Jesus, now you say this. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. Sin. Sin might be taunting you. I've been, you've been this way for years. You've been proud. You've been arrogant. You've been this. You've been that. Fine. My whole life long. Story's not done. 
Don't rejoice over me. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in the darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. The, the process of coming out into Christ is not easy. There's, there's language and metaphors like fighting the good fight of faith and working hard like a farmer or straining and training like an athlete. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against Him until He pleads my cause. He will bring me out to the light and I will look upon His vindication. And then my enemy will see. So I want to encourage us that whether there's deep, dark, difficult struggles or not, the daily habit of presenting yourself as one who is dead and alive unto God in Christ Jesus is the pathway forward that leads to more and more righteousness and ultimately to eternal life. And I'll close with a verse from Jesus. This is not just Paul and his theology. This is Jesus' theology to us. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says this. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Say that next word. Daily. Daily. You know there's other places where Jesus says to deny you yourself and take up your cross, and he doesn't use the word daily, and we think it's metaphorical, maybe a one-time thing. This is very clarifying. It's not a one-time thing. Picking up your cross daily, you learn that as you walk with Jesus. As you walk with Jesus, you be watching him and learning and watching and learning, and then he goes to the cross and gives up his life. And man, you're watching and learning a lot right there. You're saying he's laying down his life, and then three days later he rises from the dead. From the dead. That's dramatically helpful as a disciple. I'm learning a lot what it means to follow Jesus. I learn that I deny myself and I lay down my life. The whole old Mike in Adam, I'm laying that and I'm learning to lay it down more and more. I do that daily. Why? For whoever would save his life will lose it. That old life is leading you down a path of destruction and death. If you give yourself to sin, you're going to die. But if you lose your life for my sake, You surrender yourself. You present yourself to Jesus as one who is dead and now alive in Christ Jesus. You'll save it. You could gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, what would it profit you? Rather, if you lose your life, you gain all the world of Jesus. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see clearly here. Appreciate, Lord, that there's actually two clear options laid before us. Present ourselves in Adam to sin or present ourselves in Christ to God. Lord, grant us faith to present ourselves to you every day in your name. Amen.